Chapter 9, The Exposition, Expedition to the Pharmacy. I told Mrs. Terman and I told Amanda, and then I told Billy. He seemed better this morning. He'd eaten two donuts and a bowl of Special K for breakfast. Afterward, I raced him up and down two of the aisles and even got him giggling a little. Kids are so adaptable that they can scare the living shit right out of you. He was too pale, the flesh under his eyes was still puffed from the tears he had cried in the night, and his face had a horribly used look. In a way, it had become like an old man's face, as if too much emotional voltage had been running behind it for too long. But he was still alive and still able to laugh, at least until he remembered where he was and what was happening. After the wind sprints, we sat down with Amanda and Hattie Terman and drank Gatorade from paper cups, and I told him I was going over to the drugstore with a few other people. I don't want you to, he said immediately, his face clouding. It'll be all right, Big Bill. I'll bring you a Spider-Man comic book. I want you to stay here. Now his face was not just cloudy, it was thundery. I took his hand. He pulled it away. I took it again. Billy, we have to get out of here sooner or later. You see that, don't you? When the fog goes away. But he spoke with no conviction at all. He drank his Gatorade slowly and without relish. Billy, it's been almost one whole day now. I want mommy. Well, maybe this is the first step on the way to getting back to her, Mrs. Turman said. Don't build the boy's hopes up, David. What the hell, I snapped at her. The kid's got to hope for something. She dropped her eyes. Yes, I suppose he does. Billy took no notice of this. Daddy, Daddy, there are things out there, things. Yes, we know that, but a lot of them, not all, but a lot, don't seem to come out until it's nighttime. They'll wait, he said. His eyes were huge, centered on mine. They'll wait in the fog, and when you can't get back inside, they'll come to eat you up like in the fairy stories. He hugged me with fierce, panicky tightness. Daddy, please don't go. I pried his arms loose as gently as I could and told him that I had to. But I'll be back, Billy. All right, he said huskily, but he wouldn't look at me anymore. He didn't believe I would be back. It was on his face, which was no longer thundery, but woeful and grieving. I wondered again if I could be doing the right thing, putting myself at risk. Then I happened to glance down the middle aisle and saw Mrs. Carmody there. She had gained a third listener, a man with a grizzled cheek and a mean and rolling bloodshot eye. His haggard brow and shaking hands almost screamed the word hangover. It was none other than your friend and his, Myron LaFleur, the fellow who had felt no compunction at all about sending a boy out to do a man's job. That crazy witch. I kissed Billy and hugged him hard. Then I walked down to the front of the store, but not down the housewares aisles. I didn't want to fall under her eye. Three quarters of the way down, Amanda caught up with me. Do you really have to do this, she asked. Yes, I think so. Forgive me if I say it sounds like so much macho bullshit to me. There were spots of color high on her cheeks and her eyes were greener than ever. She was highly, no, royally pissed. I took her arm and recapped my discussion with Dan Miller. The riddle of the cars and the fact that no one from the pharmacy had joined us didn't move her much. The business about Mrs. Carmody did. He could be right, she said. Do you really believe that? I don't know. There's a poisonous feel to that woman. And if people are frightened badly enough for long enough, they'll turn to anyone that promises a solution. But human sacrifice, Amanda? The Aztecs were into it, she said evenly. Listen, David, you come back. If anything happens, anything, you come back. Cut and run if you have to. Not for me. What happened last night was nice, but that was last night. Come back for your boy. Yes, I will. I wonder, she said, and now she looked like Billy, haggard and old. It occurred to me that most of us looked that way, but not Mrs. Carmody. Mrs. Carmody looked younger somehow and more vital, as if she had come into her own, as if, as if she were thriving on it. We didn't get going until 9.30 a.m. Seven of us went. Ollie, Dan Miller, Mike Hatlin, Myron LaFleur's erstwhile buddy Jim, also hung over but seemingly determined to find some way to atone. Buddy Eagleton, myself. The seventh was Hilda Repler. Miller and Hatlin tried half-heartedly to talk her out of coming. She would have none of it. I didn't even try. I suspected she might be more competent than any of us, except maybe for Ollie. She was carrying a small canvas shopping basket, and it was loaded with an arsenal of Raid and Black Flag spray cans, all of them uncapped and ready for action. In her free hand, she held a Spalding Jimmy Connors tennis racket from a display of sporting goods in aisle two. What are you going to do with that, Mrs. Repler? Jim asked. I don't know, she said. 
She had a low, raspy, competent voice, but it feels right in my hand. She looked him over closely and her eye was cold. Jim Grondon, isn't it? Didn't I have you in school? Jim's lips stretched in an uneasy egg suck grin. Yes, am me and my sister Pauline. Too much to drink last night? Jim, who towered over her and probably outweighed her by 100 pounds, blushed to the roots of his American Legion crew cut. Aw, oh, no. She turned away curtly, cutting him off. I think we're ready, she said. All of us had something, although you would have called it an odd assortment of weapons. Ollie had Amanda's gun. Buddy Eagleton had a seal pinch bar from out back somewhere. I had a broom handle. Okay, Dan Miller said, raising his voice a bit. You folks want to listen up a minute? A dozen people had drifted toward the outdoor to see what was going on. They were loosely knotted, and to their right stood Mrs. Carmody and her new friends. We're going over to the drugstore to see what the situation is there. Hopefully, we'll be able to bring something back to aid Mrs. Clapham. She was the lady who had been trampled yesterday when the bugs came. One of her legs had been broken, and she was in a great deal of pain. Miller looked us over. We're not going to take any chances, he said. At the first sign of anything threatening, we're going to pop back into the market. And bring all the fiends of hell down on our heads, Mrs. Carmody cried. She's right, one of the summer ladies seconded. You'll make them notice us. You'll make them come. Why can't you just leave well enough alone? There was a murmur of agreement from some of the people who had gathered to watch us go. I said, lady, is this what you call well enough? She dropped her eyes, confused. Mrs. Carmody marched a step forward. Her eyes were blazing. You'll die out there, David Drayton. Do you want to make your son an orphan? She raised her eyes and raked us all with them. Buddy Eagleton dropped his eyes and simultaneously raised the pinch bar as if to ward her off. All of you will die out there. Haven't you realized the end of the world has come? The fiend has been let loose. Star Wormwood blazes and each one of you that steps out that door will be torn apart. And they'll come for those of us who are left, just as this good woman said. Are you people going to let that happen? She was appealing to the onlookers now and a little mutter ran through them. After what happened to the unbelievers yesterday, it's death. It's death. It's a can of peas flew across two of the checkout lanes suddenly and struck Mrs. Carmody on the right breast. She staggered backward with a startled squawk. Amanda stood forward. Shut up, she said. Shut up, you miserable buzzard. She serves the foul one, Mrs. Carmody screamed. A jittery smile hung on her face. Who did you sleep with last night, Mrs.? Who did you lie down with last night? Mother Carmody sees. Oh, yes, Mother Carmody sees what others miss. But the moment spell she had created was broken, and Amanda's eyes never wavered. Are we going, or are we going to stand here all day? Mrs. Repler asked. And we went. God help us. We went. Dan Miller was in the lead. Ollie came second. I was last, with Mrs. Repler in front of me. I was as scared as I've ever been, I think, and the hand wrapped around my broom handle was sweaty slick. There was that thin, acrid, and unnatural smell of the mist. By the time I got out the door, Miller and Ollie had already faded into it, and Hatlin, who was third, was nearly out of sight. Only 20 feet, I kept telling myself. Only 20 feet. Mrs. Repler walked slowly and firmly ahead of me, her tennis racket swinging lightly from her right hand. To our left was a red cinder block wall. To our right, the first rank of cars looming out of the mist like ghost ships. Another trash barrel materialized out of the whiteness, and beyond that was a bench where people sometimes sat to wait their turn at the payphone. Only 20 feet. Miller's probably the, by now, 20 feet is only 10 or 12 paces, so, oh my God, Miller screamed. Oh dear sweet God, look at this. Miller had gotten there, all right. Buddy Eagleton was ahead of Mrs. Repler, and he turned to run, his eyes wide and starey. She batted him lightly in the chest with her tennis racket. Where do you think you're going? She asked in her tough, slightly raspy voice, and that was all the panic there was. The rest of us drew up to Miller. I took one glance back over my shoulder and saw that the Federal had been swallowed up by the mist. The red cinder block wall faded to a thin pink, thin wash pink, and then disappeared utterly, probably five feet on the Bridgeton Pharmacy side of the outdoor. I felt more isolated, more simply alone than ever in my life. It was as if I had lost the womb. The pharmacy had been the scene of a slaughter. Miller and I, of course, were very close to it, almost on top of it. All the things in the mist operated primarily by sense of smell. It stood to reason. Sight would have been almost completely useless to them. 
hearing a little better. But as I've said, the mist had a way of screwing up the acoustics, making things that were close sound distant, and sometimes things that were far away sound close. The things in the mist followed their truest sense. They followed their noses. Those of us in the market had been saved by the power outage as much as by anything else. The electric eye doors wouldn't operate. In a sense, the market had been sealed up when the mist came, but the pharmacy doors, they had been chalked open. The power failure had killed their air conditioning and they had opened the doors to let in the breeze, only something else had come in as well. A man in a maroon t-shirt lay face down in the doorway, or at first I thought his t-shirt was maroon. Then I saw a few white patches at the bottom and understood that it had once been all white. The maroon was dried blood and there was something else wrong with him. I puzzled it over in my mind. Even when Buddy Eagleton turned around and was noisily sick, it didn't come immediately. I guess when that something that that final happens to someone, your mind rejects it at first, unless maybe you're in a war. His head was gone, that's what it was. His legs were splayed out inside the pharmacy doors, and his head should have been hanging over the low step, but his head just wasn't. Jim Grondon had had enough. He turned away, his hands over his mouth, his bloodshot eyes gazing madly into mine. Then he stumbled, staggered, back into the market. The others took no notice. Miller had stepped inside. Mike Hatlin followed. Mrs. Repler stationed herself at one side of the double doors with her tennis racket. Ollie stood on the other side with Amanda's gun drawn and pointing at the pavement. He said quietly, I seem to be running out of hope, David. Buddy Eagleton was leaning weakly against the payphone stall like someone who has gotten bad news from home. His broad shoulders shook with the force of his sobs. Don't count us out yet, I said to Ollie. I stepped up to the door. I didn't want to go inside, but I had promised my son a comic book. The Bridgeton Pharmacy was a crazy shambles. Paperbacks and magazines were everywhere. There was a Spider-Man comic and an Incredible Hulk almost at my feet, and without thinking, I picked them up and jammed them into my back pocket for Billy. Bottles and boxes lay in the aisles, a head hung, hand hung over one of the racks. Unreality washed over me. The wreckage, the carnage, that was bad enough, but the place also looked like it had been the scene of some crazy party. It was hung and festooned with what I at first took to be streamers, but they weren't broad and flat. They were more like very thick strings or very thin cables. It struck me that they were almost the same bright white as the mist itself and a cold chill sketched its way up my back like frost, not crepe. What? Magazines and books hung dangling in the air from some of them. Mike Hatlin was prodding a strange black thing with one foot. It was long and bristly. What the F is this? He asked no one in particular. And suddenly I knew. I knew what had killed all those unlucky enough to be in the pharmacy when the mist came. The people who had been unlucky enough to get smelled out. Out, out, I said. My throat was completely dry and the word came out like a lint-covered bullet. Get out of here. Ollie looked at me. David, they're spider webs, I said. And then two screams came out of the mist. The first of fear, maybe. The second of pain. It was Jim. If there were dues to be paid, he was paying them. Get out, I shouted at Mike and Dan Miller. Then something looped out of the mist. It was impossible to see it against that white background, but I could hear it. It sounded like a bullwhip that had been half-heartedly flicked, and I could see it when it twisted around the thigh of Buddy Eagleton's jeans. He screamed and grabbed for the first thing handy, which happened to be the telephone. The handset flew the length of its cord and then swung back and forth. Oh, Jesus, that hurts, Buddy screamed. Ollie grabbed for him, and I saw what was happening. At the same instant, I understood why the head of the man in the doorway was missing. The thin white cable that had twisted around Buddy's leg like a silk rope was sinking into his flesh. That leg of his jeans had been neatly cut off and was sliding down his leg. A neat circular incision in his flesh was brimming blood as the cable went deeper. Ollie pulled him hard. There was a thin snapping sound and Buddy was free. His lips had gone blue with shock. Mike and Dan were coming, but too slowly. Then Dan ran into several hanging threads and got stuck, exactly like a bug on flypaper. He freed himself with a tremendous jerk, leaving a flap of his shirt hanging from the webbing. Suddenly, the air was full of those languorous bullwhip cracks, and the thin white cables were drifting down all around us. They were coated with the same corrosive substance. I dodged two of them, more by luck than by skill. One landed at my feet, and I could hear a faint hiss of bubbling hot top. Another floated out of the air, and Mrs. Repler calmly swung her tennis racket at it. The thread stuck fast, and I heard a high-pitched twing, 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 
as the corrosive ate through the racket strings and snapped them. It sounded like someone rapidly plucking the strings of a violin. A moment later, a thread wrapped around the upper handle of the racket and it was jerked into the mist. Get back, Ollie screamed. We got moving. Ollie had an arm around Buddy. Dan Miller and Mike Hatlin were on each side of Mrs. Repler. The white strands of web continued to drift out of the fog, impossible to see unless your eye could pick them out against the red cinder block background. One of them wrapped around Mike Hatlin's left arm. Another whipped around his neck in a series of quick winding up snaps. His jugular went in a jetting, jumping explosion, and he was dragged away, head lolling. One of his bass loafers fell off and lay there on its side. Buddy suddenly slumped forward, almost dragging Ollie to his knees. He's passed out, David. Help me. I grabbed Buddy around the waist, and we pulled him along in a clumsy, stumbling fashion. Even in unconsciousness, Buddy kept his grip on his steel pinch bar. The leg that the strand of web had wrapped around hung away from his body at a terrible angle. Mrs. Repler had turned around. Where? She screamed in her rusty voice. Where behind you? As I started to turn, one of the web strands floated down on top of Dan Miller's head. His hands beat at it, tore at it. One of the spiders had come out of the mist from behind us. It was the size of a big dog. It was black with yellow piping. Racing stripes, I thought crazily. Its eyes were reddish purple like pomegranates. It strutted busily toward us on what might have been as many as 12 or 14 many-jointed legs. It was no ordinary earthly spider blown up to horror movie size. It was something totally different, perhaps not really a spider at all. Seeing it, Mike Hatlin would have understood what that bristly black thing he had been prodding at in the pharmacy really was. It closed in on us, spinning its webbing from an oval-shaped orifice on its upper belly. The strands floated out toward us in what was nearly a fan shape. Looking at this nightmare, so like the death black spiders brooding over their dead flies and bugs in the shadows of our boathouse, I felt my mind trying to tear completely loose from its moorings. I believe now that it was only the thought of Billy that allowed me to keep any semblance of sanity. I was making some sound, laughing, crying, screaming, I don't know. But Ollie Weeks was like a rock. He raised Amanda's pistol as calmly as a man on a target range and emptied it in spaced shots into the creature at point-blank range. Whatever hell it came from, it wasn't invulnerable. A black ichor splattered from its body and it made a terrible mewling sound, so low it was more felt than heard, like a bass note from a synthesizer. Then it scuttered back into the mist and was gone. It might have been a phantasm from a horrible drug dream, except for the puddles of sticky black stuff it had left behind. There was a clang as Buddy finally dropped his steel pinch bar. He's dead, Ollie said. Let him go, David. The effing thing got his femoral artery. He's dead. Let's get the Christ out of here. His face was once more running with sweat and his eyes bulged from his big round face. One of the web strands floated easily down on the back of his hand and Ollie swung his arm, snapping it. The strand left a bloody wheel. Mrs. Repler screamed, where? Again, and we turned toward her. Another of them had come out of the mist and had wrapped its legs around Dan Miller in a mad lover's embrace. He was striking at it with his fists. As I bent and picked up Buddy's pinch bar, the spider began to wrap Dan in its deadly thread, and his struggles became a grisly, jittering death dance. Mrs. Repler walked toward the spider with a can of black flag insect repellent held outstretched in one hand. The spider's legs reached for her. She depressed the button, and a cloud of the stuff jetted into one of its sparkling, jewel-like eyes. That low-pitched mewling sound came again. The spider seemed to shudder all over, and then it began to lurch backward, hairy legs scratching at the pavement. It dragged Dan's body, bumping and rolling behind it. Mrs. Repler threw the can of bug spray at it. It bounced off the spider's body and clattered to the hot top. The spider struck the side of a small sports car hard enough to make it rock on its springs, and then it was gone. I got to Mrs. Repler, who was swaying on her feet and dead pale. I put an arm around her. Thank you, young man, she said. I feel a bit faint. That's okay, I said hoarsely. I would have saved him if I could. I know that. Ollie joined us. We ran for the market doors, the threads falling all around us. One lit on Mrs. Repler's marketing basket and sank into the canvas side. She tussled grimly for what was hers, dragging back on the strap with both hands, but she lost it. It went bumping off into the mist, end over end. As we reached the end door, a smaller spider, no bigger than a cocker spaniel puppy, raced out of the fog along the side of the building. It was producing no webbing. Perhaps it wasn't mature enough to do so. As Ollie leaned one beefy shirt, shoulder against the door so Mrs. Repler could go through, 
I heaved the steel bar at the thing like a javelin and impaled it. It writhed madly, legs scratching at the air, and its red eyes seemed to find mine and mark me. David! Ollie was still holding the door. I ran in. He followed me. Pallid, frightened faces stared at us. Seven of us had gone out. Three of us had come back. Ollie leaned against the heavy glass door, barrel chest heaving. He began to reload Amanda's gun. His white assistant manager's shirt was plastered to his body, and his large, gray sweat stains had crept out from under his arms. What? Someone asked in a low, hoarse voice. Spiders, Mrs. Repler answered grimly. The dirty bastard snatched my market basket. Then Billy hurled his way into my arms, crying. I held on to him, tight.